back to Teaching the American Tradition with Professor Postel. Today we will be discussing various essays from Benjamin Franklin, um, more obscure essays than you've probably heard of um, or studied before. So this will be quite interesting as it will kind of fill in Franklin's philosophy and his philosophy of liberty and virtue. So who was Benjamin Franklin? I've given you a better picture of Franklin than you've probably seen. Everyone uses the picture that's pasted on the $100 bill. Um, that's an older Benjamin Franklin. Um, this is a little bit younger of Benjamin Franklin. He looks like more of a scholar, so I thought it would be fitting for today's lecture as we're talking about his philosophy of, of liberty and virtue. Um, so Franklin lived a very long life. He was born in January of 1706 and he passed away in April of 1790. He was, born, he was born in Boston and moved to Philadelphia at the age of 17. Um, if you want some background on that, definitely take a look at his autobiography. He has some interesting things to say about why he ended up moving to Philadelphia. Um, in 1833, he began publishing Poor Richard's Almanac, uh, which we have a bit of in our reading today. That's what we're going to be focusing on with, the, with most of our time. In 1736, he created the Union Fire Department in Philadelphia. In 1843, he founded the American Philosophical Society. In 1751, he was elected to the Pennsylvania General Assembly. Um, this was obviously still under the rule of the British Crown. Um, he later became the Postmaster General uh, under the crown, and one of his greatest contributions was actually to the Postal Service. Uh, he was widely praised for his reform of the Postal Service. Um, this was the only way that people could get letters back and forth, publications, um, and he set up a system where people would get their mail and they would get publications and pamphlets uh, weekly. So this was a big deal, much bigger than you would think, because this really facilitated a lot of the exchange of knowledge that occurred during the American Revolution and leading up to the American Revolution. And he later served as a delegate at the Federal Convention, and he was the eldest delegate at the Federal Convention at the age of 81, I believe. Um, he was so old and feeble that they often had to carry poor old Benjamin Franklin into, um, into the Federal Convention. Uh, and he played a pretty active role in the Federal Convention. Uh, urging compromise several times when the delegates were at a sort of impasse in their debates. Um, some argue that uh, we would not have a constitution if it weren't for Benjamin Franklin. Um, he, at, at the pinnacle of the uh, drama of the debates at the Federal Convention, Franklin called for prayer, and he asked that a prayer be read and that the members pray together every single morning before they debate. Um, and this soothed tempers. He also helped establish a few different compromises uh, throughout the convention. Um, so I think that it's fitting to begin with Tocqueville when we discuss Poor Richard's Almanac, um, because Tocqueville really describes why it is that Poor Richard's Almanac became so um, such an important work in America and also so popular. I'll just read a little bit of what he says in his chapter on the literary characteristics of democratic ages. Tocqueville writes, when a traveler goes into a bookseller's shop in the United States and examines the American books upon the shelves, the number of works appear extremely great, whilst that of known authors appears, on the contrary, to be very small. He will first meet with a number of elementary treatises destined to teach the rudiments of human knowledge. That's a good description, right, of Franklin's almanac. Uh, most of these books are written in Europe. The Americans reprint them, adapting them to their own country. Next comes an enormous quantity of religious works, Bibles, sermons, edifying anecdotes, controversial divinity, yada, yada, yada. He goes on. Although America is perhaps in our day the civilized country in which literature is least attended to, a large number of persons are nevertheless to be found there who take an interest in the productions of the mind and who make them, if not the study of their lives, at least the charm of their leisure hours. But England supplies these leaders, these readers with the larger portion of the books which they require. Almost all important English books are republished in the United States. The literary genius of Great Britain still darts its rays into the recesses of the forests of the New World. Um, 
he gives an interesting anecdote. I remember that I read the feudal play of Henry V for the first time in the Lord House. Um, wonderful. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that the Americans like books that provide the rudiments to human knowledge. Um, it also tells us that Americans are interested in sort of taking the ideas from elsewhere around the world and um, reading them. This sort of the Enlightenment ideal of the Americans. They're also very interested in religious works, right? Those are some of the most important and prolific works uh, circulating America. Um, Tocqueville later writes, every house has a Bible and some form of Shakespeare's plays. Um, so very interesting. All of these things that Tocqueville is talking about that are that most interest Americans, they find their way in Poor Richard's Almanac. So no wonder Poor Richard's became so prolific in its time, um, so popular, and no wonder it uh, created so much fame for Benjamin Franklin. Um, a, it captures some rudiments of human knowledge. B, it capitalizes on, on biblical language, um, biblical uh, doctrines, um, biblical teachings. And three, or C, uh, it tries to compile a whole bunch of different, what, what Franklin calls um, uh, parables. Uh, what else do we have here, right? Um, Tocqueville writes about why Greek and Latin literature are particularly useful. And notice the word useful, right? This is something that uh, Americans are very interested in, not only knowledge, but useful knowledge. Um, Tocqueville's kind of playing on that here. Uh, so Greek and Latin literature are particularly useful in democratic countries. Uh, why is that? Um, he says that in democratic nations, uh, they ought frequently to refresh themselves at the springs of ancient literature. There is no more uh, wholesome taste for the mind. Not that I hold the literary productions of the ancients to be irreproachable, but I think that they have some special merits admirably calculated to counterbalance our, per our peculiar defects. They are a prop on the side on which we are in most danger of failing. So what, uh, in what way, what are the defects? In what ways are democratic peoples most likely to fail, according to Tocqueville? Well, um, they don't like to be governed by laws or arbitrary laws, um, and they have a difficult time sticking to principles a lot of the time, right? Um, they're more interested in what's useful, they're energetic, um, they, they have a restive regard for authority. Tocqueville says they're just in general restive. So ancient knowledge that prescribes thou shalt and thou shalt not, um, virtues and vices, they're particularly useful for Americans. Why is that? Um, because it sort of grounds Americans. It stabilizes them in some sense. Uh, Franklin's work is interesting because what it tries to do is it tries to grab a lot of the teachings from a lot of these Greek and Latin um, works of literature and it tries to apply them in a simple and useful way for Americans. All right, so let's jump into Poor Richard's Almanac. So Franklin, as you may know, he writes a lot of these different parts of Poor Richard's Almanac, uh, periodically in newspapers, pamphlets, etc. Uh, he later publishes it as a full almanac, and this is kind of what you have pieces of here. Um, Franklin says that these proverbs which contain the wisdom of many ages and nations, I assembled and formed into a connected discourse, prefixed to the Almanac of 1757, as the harangue of a wise old man to the people attending an auction. Um, okay, so interesting setting, right? And interesting insight from Franklin. Uh, he's taking proverbs from all kinds of different places, um, all, all different ages, and he's trying to distill them. and. Where is his main character, this Abraham? Uh, where, is, where is he sort of talking about Poor Richard's Almanac or things that he reads in Poor Richard's Almanac? Uh, in front of a marketplace or an auction where people are going to try and outbid each other. Uh, so he's giving them a sort of lesson about how to conduct themselves. Um, of course, Franklin, uh, as is later revealed in, in the next essay that we read, uh, he very clearly wants to recall the Abraham of the Bible. Um, well, let's skip to the beginning pages. Uh, so what's going on at the outset of this work? Well, 
this Abraham fellow, he is attending an auction, as I have mentioned, and someone asks him about the taxes. Uh, someone asks him what he thinks of the taxes. Aren't they too hard? Um, aren't they unjust? Tell us what you think of these taxes. And of course, a good American that Mr. Abraham, Father Abraham is, uh, they're expecting him to basically complain, bemoan the taxes uh, that are imposed upon the American people, right? It's sort of the fashion, right? No representation, no taxation without representation is, has uh, become the sort of <laughs> bastardized uh, rallying call of the revolution that we remember from our school days. Uh, but that's not what, what Father Abraham does, right? He instead gives a lesson. He gives a lesson instead of complaining and bemoaning the taxes. Um, and what does he first say? Well, he begins by pointing out three things that actually tax human beings. Um, he tells them on page 220 that, uh, I'll just read beginning with the paragraph that begins with friends and neighbors. Friends and neighbors, the taxes are indeed very heavy. So he acknowledges that they're heavy, they're burdensome. And if those laid on by the government were the only ones that we had to pay, we might the more easily discharge them. So the taxes by the government are not the ones that he's most concerned with. But we have many others, and much more grievous to some of us. We are taxed twice as much by our idleness, three times as much by our pride, and four times as much by our folly. And from these taxes, the commissioners cannot ease or deliver us by allowing an abatement. So three things, right? Three things that he's going to focus on throughout this uh, harangue or this lecture or this sermon, whatever you want to call it, that he gives in front of this marketplace. Um, idleness taxes us twice as much as the state. Our pride taxes us three times as much as the state. And our folly taxes us four times as much as the state. Um, and there's nothing that the lawmen can do to ease those burdens. You yourself impose those burdens of idleness, pride, and folly upon yourself. Um, and throughout this lecture, or sermon, or harangue, whatever you want to call it, he works through sort of dialectically how idleness creates pride, or can perhaps make pride worse, and how pride will feed into folly. Okay, so he begins with idleness. And why is idleness a tax? He points this out on page 221. Um, at the end of the day, idleness, or principally, idleness is a tax because it wastes time. Uh, those of you who are economists, or those of you who have studied political economy, know that uh, Franklin's much ahead of his time here, right? It's not until a bit later, um, probably about 100 years later, that economic thinkers begin to argue that time is actually the most valuable resource. Uh, so Franklin is sort of discoursing on this through this character, Father Abraham, who is quoting Franklin's pen name, make-believe character, um, Richard Sanders, or poor Richard. Uh, okay, so idleness is a big, big tax because it wastes time, and time is more important than money because time is that which can allow you to make more money. Um, he says on page 221, if time be of all things the most precious, wasting time must be the greatest prodigality. He says, sloth makes all things difficult, but industry all things easy. So don't be slothful, don't waste time. And if you don't waste time, and if you are industrious rather than slothful, then it's going to make all the different things that you have to do much easier. And he says some interesting things about hope here, one of the Christian virtues, right? He says, industry need not wish. He that lives on hope will die fasting. What do you, what do you think of this from Mr. Franklin or Father Abraham? Uh, is it good or bad that he's sort of discouraging hope? Hope is one of the theological virtues. What are we to do here? Um, I think that what Franklin's doing here is some, he's feeding into a strain that we will later see sort of come to a head in Emerson. Don't hope that something is going to save you. Don't hope that the tax man will reduce taxes. Don't hope that the government will save you. Be self-reliant and industrious. Control the things that are within your control. Work hard. And don't hope that 
your hard work will end up uh, bearing fruit. Just work hard uh, for work's sake. Um, Franklin wants human beings to be self-reliant and industrious because he believes that self-mastery requires self-reliance. And self-mastery is the only way that individuals can rule themselves in free regimes. On page 222, he says, If you were a servant, would you not be ashamed if a good master should catch you idle? Are you then your own master? Be ashamed to catch yourself idle, Franklin says. So in, in a free regime, you are your own master. Don't bemoan the tax man. Don't be idle. Work hard, be industrious, and rule yourself. Uh, he goes on and talks about leisure on page 223. So if you're discouraging idleness, Mr. Franklin or Father Abraham, um, what about leisure? Isn't leisure something that's pretty good? Isn't it necessary for Enlightenment thinkers to... Uh, have leisure to read, to do things that are sort of pleasant, to observe beauty. What do you think of leisure, Mr. Father Abraham, Benjamin Franklin? Um, on page 223, he defines leisure as time for doing something useful. This is very interesting, right? Um, this is not how leisure is ordinarily defined or discussed. When you're at rest and doing something pleasant, yet serious, um, is that useful? Do you practice leisure? Do you paint? Uh, Winston Churchill, the way that he practices leisure in his essay on hobbies, he says, is he paints. Is that useful? Is it useful for Mr. Churchill to spend his time painting? Absolutely not. There are a million different ways that Churchill could maximize his output in his given time, but he chooses to paint. And why does he do that? Well, Churchill explains, and he quotes Aristotle to explain, Aristotle says that leisure is an end in itself. Um, and gentlemanly or noble leisure, according to Aristotle, in the ethics, um, involves pleasure, happiness, and living blessedly. So, what are we to make of this? Why does Franklin give such a, such a strict definition? Why does he counsel Americans to use their leisure time, not for studies, not to, you know, become thinkers or philosophers? Why does he tell them to do something useful with their leisure? I think it's because he kind of distrusts Americans. I think that he distrusts giving Americans who have freedom such a broad definition for leisure. Um, does he leave Aristotle out of his thought? I don't think he completely leaves Aristotle out. I think he... I think that he uses Aristotle throughout. Um, you can see instances where he actually adopts some of Aristotle's virtues, although he doesn't really strictly adhere to them, right? He's gathering all kinds of different information from all kinds of different thinkers from all kinds of different ages. Um, I think that he gives this stricter definition to do something useful with your leisure because he doesn't trust democratic people with aimless leisure. On page 223, for example, he says, trouble springs from idleness and grievous toil from needless ease, right? Um, so don't be too idle in your free time. Um, because if you're too idle, then you can really get yourself into some trouble, he seems to believe. And Americans, with their freedom, tend to get themselves into trouble. Um, in addition, Franklin later in this piece urges care for ordering one's affairs. Be careful. He also urges orderliness. That's one of his virtues. He urges frugality. He begs the reader not to indulge too much in luxury or dessert. And what do Americans tend to do when they have free time? Well, indulge in luxury or dessert. Um, not like cake dessert, but... Um, doing whatever one wants licentiously, uh, indulging in extravagancies unnecessarily. Why don't why does Franklin not want us to indulge in luxury and dessert? Why does he want us to um, 
not use our free time to indulge? Why is he worried about the abuse of freedom? It appears that he sees, uh, she sees some problem with the promise of liberty. Men in America seem to abuse liberty by acting licentiously, rather than ordering their freedom with their free time, uh, doing things that they know they can get away with, uh, indulging in vices that might be trifling vices. Franklin really worries about this. Um, and this comes out when he talks about pride, vanity, and luxury. He begins to talk about pride, vanity, and luxury on pages 226 and 227. On page 226, he says, By these and of other extravagancies, the genteel are reduced to poverty. Right? Don't indulge too much in these extravagances. Uh, you're going to be reduced to poverty. You don't understand what might be the outcome, you um, hasty American who hasn't thought through the consequences of all of your actions. Um, he says that by these and other extravagancies, the genteel are reduced to poverty and forced to borrow of those whom they formerly despised, but who, uh, through industry and frugality, have maintained their standing. In which case, it appears plainly that a plowman on his legs is higher than a gentleman on his knees, as poor Richard says. Right? So, um, so Franklin is saying here, or Father Abraham is saying, don't indulge too much in luxury. Don't take out loans to buy a bunch of nice suits um, or pretty rings or whatever it is. Um, don't go into debt to make yourself look or appear cultured. It's not worth it. It's better to be a beggar and stand on your feet and be free to conduct your own affairs than to look like a gentleman or to have the appearance of someone who is rich, who is lordly, and actually live on your knees, live without freedom, beholden to someone else. Um, and as you have read, he goes through a lot of um, he, he goes through a lot of different effects that borrowing and a sort of excessive love of extravagancies. Um, will lead one to, right? Um, and ultimately, what they lead to is the human being is not free if he goes into debt in order to sort of fuel these excessive wants. Um, he argues that if you're trying to uh, fulfill all of these different wants, you will very quickly realize that you have no extra money left for your needs. Um, he says on page 227, "'Tis easier to suppress the, suppress the first desire than to satisfy all that follow it." On page 228, he says that debt, lying, and deceit um, follow from a sort of indulgence in these extravagancies. And why would one indulge in these extravagancies? Well, because of one's pride, right? One is prideful of one's position, and one wants to appear good enough to be praised and admired by others, even if one isn't, um, or doesn't have the character that's worthy of praise or admiration. Um, let's go on to page 228. As you can see, oh, I didn't give you page 228. Um, well, as you can see, all of these different things, debt, lying, and deceit, these are examples of circumstances, according to Father Abraham, that can lead one into folly. These circumstances, being in debt, lying, whether it be about your character or about when you're going to pay someone, and deceiving others to believe that you're something that you're not. These have their roots in pride, but what they will eventually do is they will make you act foolishly, uh, because you'll be forced to lie about your character, and you'll be forced to lie and be dishonorable, quite frankly, to those that you've taken loans from, gone into debt to, that you can no longer repay. It's a sort of snowball effect. Right? Um, I don't think that, we're, that any of us are ignorant to uh, the problems of debt in our country. Um, massive credit card debt uh, and all other kinds of debt that people have gotten into that uh, leads them to do pretty desperate things. Puts strain on them, on their hearts and their souls and their minds so that they can't focus on the things that are, that are truly good and true and beautiful. Okay, so to wrap up, let's go to page 229, uh, 230 and 231. Now, after all of this, 
after discussing pride, idleness, and folly, um, we begin to think that this Father Abraham guy uh, isn't exactly very Abrahamic. Uh, where's God, Mr. Father Abraham? Well, on page 230, providence, heaven, and God come into the picture. He ends by saying, This doctrine, my friends, is reason and wisdom, but after all, do not depend too much upon your own industry and frugality and prudence, though excellent things, for they may all be blasted without the blessing of heaven. And therefore, ask that blessing humbly, and be not uncharitable to those that at present seem to want it, but comfort and help them. Remember, Job suffered and was afterward prosperous. Interesting, right? Um, so pray to heaven, but isn't it true that you told us not to hope too much? Well, what's prayer without hope? Uh, it's interesting, interesting to ponder. And many people more intelligent than me and uh, with better qualifications than I have uh, have talked about Franklin and Franklin's God. Uh, but it's interesting to ponder what exactly, uh, what position does heaven or providence have in Franklin's sort of moral philosophy, virtue ethics, and philosophy of freedom. Uh, so what happens at the close of this story? It's kind of funny, right? After this has all been done, what happens? Uh, I, he, he goes on, and uh, now it's now it's Richard Saunders, so poor Richard talking to us at the end. Thus the old man ended his, ended his harangue. The people heard it and approved the doctrine. Oh, they agree. And immediately practiced the contrary, just as if it had been a common sermon. Uh, so it's very interesting, right? Um, these Americans, they, they agree, but they just don't have the metal to practice the virtues that they agree with to do the difficult thing, which is put the virtues into action. Um, so in the next essay, Franklin gives us some, some tips, uh, a sort of lesson on how we can put the virtues into action. Um, now, worth consulting here is Franklin's 13 virtues that he writes himself at the age of 20 and his checklist. Um, we're not going to consult these. We're not going to talk about these at length. They could be discussed for an extra 50 minutes, so I will, I will not detain you for too long. Um, but they're worth thinking about, right? You can read more about these, by the way, in, in his autobiography. Um, what we will discuss, though, is this letter from Father Abraham to his beloved son. So there's, there's speculation about whether or not Franklin wrote this. I'm not sure if I'm completely convinced that Franklin wrote it, um, but it is in Franklin's nephew's journal, um, in, in his nephew's publication. Uh, it's by Father Abraham, and it's a letter to his son. And there are a lot of themes that uh, are Franklin, Frank, Franklinian in this piece that uh, we can pick up on and we can see a thread running through a lot of Franklin's work. So for our purposes, we'll just choose to believe. We'll, we'll suspend our doubt. And we'll say that, yeah, Franklin wrote this. Because even if Franklin didn't write it, then it seems that whoever did write this was influenced by Franklin and by poor Richard. Okay, so what is this letter? What's it doing? Um, well, it urges daily self-examination for the acquirement of solid, uniform, and steady virtue. But this letter says that self-examination is not enough. Uh, Father Abraham goes on to say that you need a monitor, a sort of mentor, and even suggests you need a community to sort of keep you, uh, keep you true, keep you true to the practice of these virtues, or else you will end up like those people who Father Abraham were talking to who agreed, but then went and did the exact opposite because the temptation was too great. Um, What, uh, what he seems to be urging is to take up a monitor or a mentor, um, constantly practice self-examination, so keep a journal, he urges. Keep a journal at the, end of the, at the end of the day, he says, is probably the best way to do it. Go through all the things that you've done in the day and figure out how virtuous you've been or how vicious you've been. 
record that, write about it, think about it, and pray. Um, and he urges some things to be specifically aware of. He says, beware of dishonesty. Beware of first bad acts, right? Another thing that we saw uh, from the Poor Richard section. And he ends up with this. Endeavor to do good. Um, he urges near the end, don't merely try to get the advantage of appearing good. He argues that one should really and truly wish to be good. Um, he says, but again, suppose it possible for a knave to preserve a fair character among men, and even to approve his own actions. What, what is that to the certainty of his being discovered and detested by the all-seeing eye of that righteous being who made and governs the world, whose just hand never fails to do right and to punish iniquity, and whose approbation, favor, and friendship is worth the universe. So no matter what usefulness you can get from virtue, endeavor to do good for good's sake. Why? Well, because there's some being who could award you all the blessings in the world um, who's powerful enough to do that he could give you anything that you want, but that's not the goal. The goal is to, if there is such a creator, Franklin seems to suggest, to want to do things that are pleasing to him. It's not enough to just appear to be good. It's not enough to just want to get the advantage of being good, but truly endeavor to be good. And for our last piece, this is a very interesting piece by Franklin. Um, this is called A Man of Sense. And it's a dialogue that Franklin has written. It's a Socratic dialogue between Socrates and Crito. Um, and they're trying to define what exactly a man of sense is. Uh, Socrates is upset because he can't figure out what a man of sense is. Crito uses the term, but he can't quite define it. So what is a man of sense? Well, it's the Enlightenment gentleman. It's what people in the Enlightenment were going around and they're saying, oh, this man is a man of sense. He's, he's a sensible human being. Um, he's sensible and rational, thoughtful, well-read. Um, so Socrates sort of presses, presses this Crito character on what exactly it is to be a man of sense. Uh, Crito first seems to suggest that a man of knowledge is a man of sense. And Socrates sort of presses him and says, oh, man of knowledge. Well, what kind of knowledge? If a man has knowledge of pushpins, is he a man of sense? Crito says, no, that's no good. That, that can't be right, because I've known people with knowledge of pushpins who are not sensible. They're not gentlemen. It's not impressive. Socrates suggests, well, what about math? No, that doesn't sit right for Crito either. Well, Socrates suggests, what about terms? What if people know terms really well? What if people uh, read the dictionary? No, that doesn't make sense. Um, okay, well, what about a man who knows all kinds of different languages, Socrates suggests. That doesn't satisfy Crito either. Well, by the end, where do they, where do they arrive? Socrates declares that knowledge does not make, man, make one a man of sense. Uh, well, then what does, Mr. Socrates? What makes a man a man of sense? He says that what makes a man a man of sense is action and willingness to be good doing good and wanting to be good. Of course, one has to have no, presumably one has to have knowledge of what, what the good is, or at least a rough knowledge of what the good life kind of looks like and entails, what the virtues are. Um, but that's not what matters most to Franklin Socrates. What matters the most is that one is willing to perform the action and one really wants to be good. I'll just read the last paragraph here for you. The Socrates character says, It seems to follow, then, that the vicious man, though master of many sciences, must needs be an ignorant and foolish man, for being, as he is vicious, of consequence unhappy, either he has acquired only the useless sciences, or having acquired such as might be useful, he knows not how to make them contribute to his happiness. And though he may have every other science, he is ignorant of that science of virtue is of more worth and of more consequence to his happiness than all the rest put together. And since he is ignorant of what principally concerns him, 
though it has been told him a thousand times from parents, press, and pulpit, the vicious man, however learned, cannot be a man of sense, but is a fool, a dunce, and a blockhead. So don't go around calling people sensible, or don't go around and call people gentlemen if they don't know what the good is, if they don't try and participate in the good, if they're not willing to do the difficult things necessary for virtue. They're not gentlemen because they're not participating in the good life. They're ignorant of the good life, despite the fact that they know all kinds of different things about science, about mathematics, about nuclear bombs, about hydrogen, whatever it may be. What's most important is that one knows what is good and tries to endeavor to do good. But the question arises, right? If democratic societies are likely to sort of go off the rails and we have the sort of dogma of public opinion and Franklin points to parents, press, and the pulpit as the things that are going to point man towards the good, what happens if society does go off the rails as Gouverneur Morris and as Tocqueville worry that it might? Then what are we to do, Mr. Franklin? Franklin doesn't give us much on this. This is something you might want to ponder in lieu of Franklin. What happens if society no longer, democratic society, no longer embraces virtue ethics? Then what do you do? This is a sort of question we can look forward to um, when we read Emerson and Thoreau, perhaps. All right, well, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it, and I look forward to speaking with you next time.